Greetings Pilgrims and welcome to episode 69 of the Innsmouth Book Club. As you can see once again we've brought you into the lobby of the Gilman Hotel where we're going to go upstairs and meet our guests for today. I'm one of your guides Rob Poynton. And I'm the other one Tim Mendes. Yes we've been joined all the way from sunny Wiltshire by Mr Simon Bleakin. So yeah which let's mount the creaky stairs and go and say hello shall we? Yeah I just wanted to say actually last time we were here they were decorating yeah. And yet looking around now, it looks as shabby and run down as decayed as it did before. What's that about? Yeah, I don't know. I'm, uh, maybe they were cleaning the shog off slime off the skirting boards or something. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> All right, here we go, up to room 428. And here's our guest for today. It's Mr. Simon Bleakin. Hi, Simon. How are you doing? Hello, I'm good. Thanks. How are you? Yeah. Yeah. All good. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. So is this your first visit to Innsmouth? Um, I've crept in and out a few times over the years, but I've never stayed after dark. Wise. <laughs> Wise. <laughs> but I hear the bus has broken down, so who knows? <laughs> Yeah, that's that's how they that's how they get you. What we do now is we bring bicycles, you see, so we can cycle out. But uh, <laughs> you get to experience the full delights of Innsmouth at yeah, night. Sounds nice. <laughs> <laughs> so perhaps we can start with a little bit about your background, where you're from, and so on, and how you got into sort of weird fiction and Lovecraft in particular. Yeah, uh, well, as you know, I live in Wiltshire. I'm originally from Bristol, um, and I I got into Lovecraft about age 15 is when I started reading him but I got into him a lot before then because um growing up I, I liked horror fiction I liked weird things I liked very interested in ghosts and supernatural and, and strange stories uh, I used to read a lot of Poe, Blackwood, Mac and things like that um and became a huge fan as I think as I mentioned to him once before of Ghostbusters which got me into the real Ghostbusters oh yes <laughs> and uh, about 12 I watched an episode called The Collect Call of Cthulhu uh, yeah. And since then, I still keep wanting to say Cthulhu rather than Cthulhu, but we can't pronounce it anyway, so it doesn't matter. Exactly. And uh, it just lodged a seed in my head. And when I was a little bit older, I, I went looking for Lovecraft and uh, ended up buying the Omnibus editions, which uh, had very interesting covers, piles of heads and naked women, and ghouls. And, and uh, I loved them. Yeah, absolutely loved them. Yeah, there was one, wasn't there, with a pile of heads and like a, a woman falling down this like abyss sort of tunnel thing. I remember that vividly in my head. And a big Nurgle thing that was eating her, yeah. Yeah, that's it, Nurgle. that's it. Yeah. yeah. I wonder if that's something that's ever been covered, actually. People talk a lot about Frazetta and sort of sword and sorcery art, but uh, perhaps we need to do an episode on Lovecraft art for, for books. There's some interesting stuff there. There is. Yeah, that'll be good. <laughs> But so, yeah, so um, from there I got into uh, Clark Ashton Smith, which was a revelation, really. He needed a dictionary, but uh, the way he paints with words was incredible. And then <laughs> Robert E. Howard, Henry Cutner, and, and so on. And uh, I was also into a lot of Stephen King, and I still am. Um, so I try to, with my work, I try to combine my love of the old style with some of the new and see where it takes me. Yeah, yeah. Um, and when did you first start writing? What, what prompted you to first start writing? Um, I got into, uh, well, a friend was interested in writing and I, I tagged along with him to a writer's circle. And I thought, well, you know, I love stories. I always have. I love hearing stories. I've always loved telling stories, but I never thought of doing anything with it. So I, I had a go. I was about, I think, 15, 16. Um, and I started sending things off. I think the first thing I had was a young author's magazine at the age of 60, you know, starting out the right way piece, which was a load of rubbish, really. But uh, it was my first sort of toe in the water really um after that i started signing up to newsletters and things and sending things out to uh, cracked mirror mysteries and places like that i sort of haunted the small press uh and eventually i, I sort of put it on hold for a while because i got into other things like evening classes and, and life kind of took over but in the last uh, eight nine years or so i've been pushing to get back into it and really do something with my writing yeah, it's it's a very sim very similar sort of tale to a lot of people. They start out writing quite early, 
uh, and then life gets in the way. It's exactly what happened to me, <laughs> you know, like go catering college yeah. and all this sort of stuff that's got in the way. And then after a while, it's just like, you know what? I'm, I, this is what I really want to do. For me, it was like uh, ancient Egypt. I, I had a love of ancient Egypt. So I used to do evening classes at Bristol University and had dreams of going off to uni that never quite happened. But uh, it's there as a passion now, so... <laughs> And did did you did you get out to Egypt at all? Have you been to the pyramids? Been a few times, yeah. Um, oh, wow. Twenty years ago now. It's yeah. you know I've got a job and a mortgage. It doesn't happen these days. <laughs> oh, well. well, yeah, and uh, travel has been somewhat curtailed, has not it, over the last <laughs> few years? <laughs> yeah, for one reason. And and from what I hear, the outskirts of Cairo are literally right up to the edge of the pyramids now. Pretty it's much. bizarre. There's a McDonald's and then there's the pyramid. Oh. It's really strange. Yeah, all the photos are pointing one way for a reason. Ah, yeah, I have often wondered that, why it's always from yes. the same angle. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. There's a very good reason for right. that. You turn around and there's a building, so. I, I think that that kind of twists my melon a bit. If you look out your bedroom window and you can see the, the Great Pyramid, <laughs> it's like a bit of a sort of... <laughs> the Great Pyramid and then a Starbucks. <laughs> yeah. If you go somewhere like Saqqara, you get a bit more of an authentic feel. That's further out, so it feels a bit more isolated. Right. Yeah. But yeah, no, the pyramids are, are right on top of Cairo. It's a bit of a shame, but uh, at least you're staying in Cairo. You don't have far to go. Well, there is <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. You, you don't have to do that old hire the guides sort of thing anymore. I suppose you just yeah. get your bus. Yeah. Yeah, imprisoned with the pharaohs. There we go. Yeah, yes, there yeah. you go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Though uh, you don't let you on the top of the pyramids anymore, unfortunately. <laughs> Not that I'd want to fight someone on the top of a pyramid. No, I can think of better places to have a punch up <laughs> on the top yeah. of a pyramid. Macclesfield on a Saturday night. Yeah, yeah, Macclesfield, there you go. <laughs> so does your love of Egyptology and the Lovecraftian kind of tie in together? There's there's obviously some connections there. Were, did they sort of come about at the same time or did one lead to the um, other? Yeah, I think Lovecraft, it was about the same time, to be honest, and... Uh, yeah, I did enjoy reading um, is, is In Prison with the Pharaohs or Under the Pyramids, whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah, definitely. And, and I think it, it does help as well, having an interest in ancient history. If you're building a, a an alien or a fantasy civilization, you can draw on fragments from different cultures and different times and put them together. And I think that, that definitely comes into it. Yeah. And we always say, don't we, Tim, that's one of the beauties of, well, weird fiction in general, but Lovecraft in particular, you can put it into any setting you like, yeah. any time in history or future or anything. Yeah, yeah. sort of the, the themes of cosmic horror that you can just put anywhere you like. And that's something I've always liked about it. I've always like uh, have a game with myself of trying to find the what's the strangest place I could put some cosmic horror, you know, back room of a supermarket or, you know. As I say, sometimes it's, it's when it's least expected is when it works most effectively. Absolutely, absolutely. It's, uh, do you see that recent film, Glorious? It's ridiculous, but I loved it. Uh, it's a low-budget American hor uh, horror film, and it's uh, he's basically on a road trip, and he stops off this roadside truck stop thing, and he goes into the stalls to do his business, and there's a glory hole, and there's a cosmic horror on the other side of this glory hole, an eldritch abomination, which then traps him in this thing. And the whole thing is this guy's interaction with an eldritch abomination <laughs> through a glory hole. It's ridiculous, but it's well worth a watch. I'll have to that one up. <laughs> it's genius in a way. In well. <laughs> exactly. This is it. <laughs> so truck stops and glory holes aside. <laughs> so, do you have um do you have like a favorite setting for your own stories? Do you tend to work in a modern setting or do you do you mix things up? I like to vary it. I mean I, I I do everything from sort of science fiction to fantasy to to sort of yeah, modern day to back in the 30s to 20s. It, it seems to be just whatever the story calls for. But I think that having the variety really just helps. You know, it, it stops us to from feeling the same as well. If you can yeah. do a different setting each time, and and I like to try and push myself with each story. So you don't want everything to be too samey. Just try a different setting, try a different genre, try a different time. Um, but yeah, I, I think most of what I do has horror in it, whether it's got a fantasy setting or a science fiction setting. Uh, I recently did. Um, a story for Hellbound Books, which was um, Infinity's Embrace, and that's a cosmic horror, but it's set on a starship charting the uh, the middle of the galaxy down by Sagittarius A, the, the supermassive black hole. Nice. nice. Yeah. Awesome. I mean, in, in some ways, 
uh, I don't know, Tim's got some views on this, following one of his anthologies, but uh, the space setting is ideal for cosmic horror because you're re- already very much in the cosmos as a very small speck, you know. That, that yeah. feeling of irrelevance yeah. is, is already there, isn't it? But it doesn't necessarily make... <laughs> I was thinking of you and your. How many submissions for oh, your cosmic? Well, form? well, the thing is, I had um, like nearly three hundred submissions for it, but I don't know what happened. There was a lot of people who didn't understand there was a difference between little grey, little green men, and cosmic horror. So I got a lot of UFO abductions and alien. I got so many anal probes in that submission window. It was ridiculous. It was. <laughs> <laughs> but uh but yeah the, the ones that you know set in space that do have the cosmic horror element not just alien invasion stuff because there is a big difference yeah you know? yeah and I, I guess an example the the best example that certainly on film would be alien itself right yeah yeah event horizon would be another good example that's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great film. <laughs> and when you're writing science fiction, I mean, I've touched on science fiction in a short story or two, and I did a couple of novels that were like military science fiction, which isn't really science fiction because it's just Sven Hassel in space, you know, kind of thing. Or whatever. <laughs> but how, yeah. how far do you go into the science? Or do you just say they've got a warp drive and that's it? They've got a warp drive and that's it. I very <laughs> just I, I focus more on the story and the world is just there to support the story. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean I'm a pretty big fan of of Doctor Who and Star Trek, so and, and Alien and you know, things like that. And um it's yeah, it's you pretty much just assume that they've got faster than light travel, they've got starships and uh it it's that's just the setting for the story mostly. So whether people would purists would say that is sci-fi i don't know but i call it sci-fi <laughs> no i would totally agree because again again this is something we've talked about before oh, before we're both big fans of doctor who and i come from to sci-fi from that end of it as well where it's not really explained it's all pseudoscience yeah. it's you know <laughs> there's a thing that could go faster than light yeah great um it's a big difference i've never really managed to get into that hard sci-fi where they go into minute details about everything. Now, I guess it's horses for courses, mm. isn't it? It's what, what you're into. But I like what you say there. It's uh, more of the story-driven end of sci-fi yeah. that, that appeals. Definitely, you know? yeah. It's there to serve the story, not the story there to serve the science. And you know, It's where can it take you? Where can your imagination go next? Yeah, I mean, it's it's just it's the same as any location thing, isn't it? It's um, it just opens up the horizons even more, yeah. Because you can come up with all kinds of weird and wonderful flora and fauna to sort of augment your story. You don't, we don't need to know how it grows or what soil it's in, you know. Yeah. One thing around that summit we often say about Clark Ashton Smith is his aliens are usually really alien, aren't they? It, it, yeah. It's not the Star Trek bloke in a suit kind of job. No. <laughs> But uh, there's also, I mean, it's talking about Clark Ashton Smith. It's is it the vaults of Yovombis where it's almost alien-like. There's things on the heads, mm. and, you know. That's just a brilliant story, and that that for me is an example of he's not worried about the science behind how they got out there. He's worried about what happens when they get there. Yeah, and it's worth the journey. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tremendous story. Yeah, it, I mean, most of his uh, like well, I can't I can never remember the title of it. Was it the Measurable Horror? The one that's that big, like proto shock oh, thing shog that, keep, on Venus. that keeps yeah. growing on Venus. Yeah. I love that. There's just something about yeah. that. It's just a superb story. But again, he, he doesn't. He spends like maybe a paragraph on the voyage there, and then they're there, and there you go. That's all. Yeah. That's what it's about. Being there is the important part, definitely. And I suppose there's two things there about the weird tale. One is that not everything is explained. There's always that element. But also that idea of atmosphere above everything else, uh, and with Lovecraft, I mean sometimes it's a criticism levels at Lovecraft that it's all atmosphere and very little character. So, where where do you stand on that sort of balance? I've I've always gone with atmosphere first. I think if if you've got a story with a good atmosphere, that's that's everything really especially in weird fiction i think it it's what separates it in a way from horror is that the atmosphere is such a character in itself um i mean i'm thinking here of um 
going back to Clark Ashton Smith again, sorry, but The Abominations of Yondo is a story that I love. I love the opening paragraph yes. where he talks about how the desert is, the meteorites, all of that. The, the plot is wafer thin, but you're not really there for the plot. You're there for the way he paints with language and the atmosphere and the journey it takes you on. Yeah. When really it's just a guy running across the desert, gets scared and runs back again. But, <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah. It, it's the whole atmosphere that makes the story. In my opinion, absolutely, <laughs> oh, totally, yeah. and and again, in that he, he creates a whole backstory for the world in a paragraph, and it, it's yeah, you, you want to know more about it, you know, it's so engrossing, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think that that's one of Clark Ashton Smith's biggest strengths is his ability to convey a hell of a lot in a very short <laughs> short amount of words. You know, the yeah. the amount of you know other people would spend a couple of pages to get across what he gets across in a paragraph. Yeah, I think yeah. it's tremendous. And he had a vocabulary like no other. Oh, <laughs> yeah, don't we know it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when it comes to pronunciations and everything else, then that's, uh, that's something else. But I, I think both of us feel that reading Smith, as we've been doing for uh, Strange Shadows, has, has enriched our vocabularies immeasurably. <laughs> immeasurably so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and in a most audacious fashion. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Yeah, to the point where we've started, <laughs> it's become a game now when we do stories <laughs> to try and get the most Smithian w phrase or word in there. You know, so we have fulgurance, pecuniary <laughs> depletion, all this kind of stuff gets thrown around, doesn't it? You know. And speaking of that, I, I think we've shared we've shared pages, haven't we, in a in an anthology or two. Uh, I think in the Shadow Over Dogger Land. Yep, that's one. Yeah, that was. And a... uh, Lovecraftiana, old dear old Gavin's yes. uh, magazine. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a good one. I like that one. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. I've been in a few episodes of a few episodes issues of Schlock as well, which has been oh, a, right. it's a really good magazine or yeah. webzine or whatever yeah. you want to call it. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's, it's it's really good to uh, these past few years, especially. I've really begun to make a lot of contacts within the the writing community, and it's it's great to meet everyone and uh, mm. be on things like this, you know, which wouldn't have happened before, which is nice. Well, yeah, we found it. Um... You know, so it's overall, I'd say 99% is a very supportive community, yeah, which definitely, uh, which to mm. us harkens back to that whole sort of Lovecraft circle or Smithian circle or whatever you want to call it. Everyone seemed very supportive of everyone else, yeah, yeah, uh, it's, it's a good atmosphere, yeah. And it, you notice it like from myself doing anthologies and Rob doing anthologies, um, that. It, yeah, the, the sort of enthusiasm of people and to, when you invite them to play in your sandbox, it is the, like, to me, it is harking back to that sort of Lovecraft circle thing of uh, like, oh, I've got this. Do you want to play with it? There you go. Off yeah. you go. Play with the Hounds of Tinderloss for a bit, you know. Oh, well, you can have Yig. There you go. <laughs> sort of thing, you know. It is um, it is really cooperative in that yeah. sort of way. And there's no, there doesn't seem to be much sort of like a catty... <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of a competition, you know? It's like we're all trying to, we're all going towards the same goal, I think, which is, which is yeah. great. Yeah, madness. Yeah, exactly. And it is nice to be able to create your own things, but also draw on what exists. Yeah. Yes. I, mean, I think of other fandoms like, say, Star Trek, which I'm, as I say, I'm a huge fan, but they're so fighting all the time over canon. What's, oh, I know. what's official and what's not. But here it's just like, yeah, go with it. Have fun. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and it's a nice feeling. Nice feeling. And if you get into Lord of the Rings fandom, then you you need to have a degree in <laughs> in Gondorian history. You know, heaven forbid you get the the color of the badge wrong or something. Or no, the there should be thirteen leaves, not twelve, on the standard and all that kind of thing. It's it's quite something. Yeah. I'm too scared to go near it. <laughs> yeah, same, same. I stayed way away, well away from most of that kind of fandom. I, I used to be heavily involved in Doctor Who fandom back in the sort of 90s and early 2000s. And I ran away from that because it got, it got it started getting really like, you know, it's like, well, the Virgin New Adventures aren't canon and that's not canon. Oh God, I'm out, I'm out. <laughs> but canon must be very difficult in things like Doctor Who and, and Star Wars and all of this because they've been created by so many different people. Exactly. Whereas at least Tolkien, J.R.R.R., Christopher Tolkien, that's it, you know. Yeah. Um, and I think with with Lovecraft, you you can do pretty much anything, can't you? Really? Yeah. I don't think anyone's ever said, "Oh, you no, no, you can't have Cthulhu fighting Godzilla." Well, you can if you want. It doesn't. It doesn't. 
doesn't seem to matter. Because it almost doesn't work if you try and define it too closely anyway, because the whole point is it's meant to be unknowable. Because that's what makes it scary is you can never really get a handle on it. Exactly. I mean, there was contradictions in Lovecraft's own work. You know, there was certain things he'd say about, say, Niall Athotep in one story that would contradict what he'd say in the other. But that was a conscious yeah. thing because because of like organized religion and things like that. And the, 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 the contradictions that exist in all that, it makes it seem more real. So, yeah. You know, I've always thought of that when it comes to that kind of thing. It's just like, well, you know, <laughs> if Lovecraft could contradict himself, then. <laughs> it does give us a lot more freedom, yeah. which is good. <laughs> and you're right, because myths and things, they they always change and they shift and they, they, they distort over time. And it makes them more interesting. Exactly. Yeah. In, in that sense, then, do you think that uh, what we could see in a Lovecraftian story today uh, would be... Uh, or, or do you take Lovecraft's themes and you you adapt them for a, a modern sensibility uh, on, on, on all sorts of levels? I mean, uh, in, in one sense, cosmic is timeless, but in the other sense, the, the way we come to it is perhaps through a different lens from 100 years ago or whatever. Well, I remember I, I read somewhere someone saying that they thought it was harder to do that kind of fiction in the modern age where you've got CCTV cameras everywhere, everyone's got a smartphone, it's harder to isolate people. It's harder to find corners of the world that haven't been intruded upon. And I suppose in a sense that's true, but it's still possible. And that's that's part of the challenge now, I think, is to find new ways to tell those stories in the world we know today. Yeah, I think it, I think it gives you an opportunity because then you can play with these new toys. You know, you can have something infiltrate in the internet or in the cctv or the, the cosmic horror in the phone you yeah. know I, I, I don't think it really matters i mean to isolate people yeah i mean I've, I've come up with some real MacGuffins to get rid of mobile phones and things like that but you know once once the, you've dealt with it it's fine isn't it you know yeah and if you live where i do you can see that cell signal isn't always that great anyway so <laughs> exactly <laughs> Well, that's it. I, I was I was just going to say that, and and in a sense, there can be just as much sense of isolation, even if mm. you're connected to the internet, or perhaps a, a feeling of isolation yeah. if you lose that connection. You know, you lose your phone signal. This, uh, you know, there's even a thing. I went out a few weeks ago and I left my phone at home, and it's like, oh shit. You know, it's it's that's how yeah. pervasive this Absolutely. stuff is now. Yeah, I guess you could say Lovecraft would. You've carried on writing. If you were still alive today, he'd be using the modern world just as we are. So it's just an evolution, isn't it, really? Definitely. Yeah. So something else we talk about is this idea of we're creating uh, horrors or horrible situations. And we live in a world where there's plenty of horrible stuff going on. How do we get that balance? <laughs> this was highlighted for me. In fact, just this morning, I was looking at one forum and they've banned talk of the mini sub that has gone missing by the Titanic because people were saying, ah, oh, deep ones. <laughs> and someone pointed out that there's people in this, you know, this is happening now. Yeah. Um, maybe yeah. in a, a year's time. <laughs> I don't know. So how, how does that work for you, maintaining that balance between uh, creating a, a, a horror or creating a feeling of, of horror and actually uh, disturbing people, I suppose? Yeah, I, I kind of approach it as almost like a dark fantasy kind of. I, I don't worry too much about trying to tie it into real world events in that sense. I think that um, I just tell the stories that, that that come to me and I don't try and base them on anything that's going on. I mean, I've never done stories, for example, around, say, school shootings or anything like that, because it that just feels a bit too raw and real. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I guess in time... Anything is eventually up for for grabs, isn't it? With enough time having passed, you know, things fade into history, and then it becomes sort of fair game. It seems. Yeah. But, um, I don't actually read the news much either, so I don't really base a lot of stories on the news. I find it too depressing, so I tend to just pick it up through Facebook usually. But um, generally, if it's if it's too hot and too fresh, I try and do something to distract people from the terrible things that go on in the world by giving them other terrible things to enjoy. <laughs> If that makes sense. <laughs> I, to I totally agree with you that. It was like during the uh, the pandemic, um, it was probably my my most prolific period because I basically just sat down and wrote for the entirety of it just to take my mind off all the hell that was going on outside, right? And uh, there was a publisher 
and they were like, oh, we're going to do pandemic stories. And I was like, are you insane? It's like, like nobody is going to buy that. <laughs> Nobody's going to want to write for that. You know, we want things to take our minds off it. I mean, fi- yeah, we've had enough of that. Yeah, fiction is an escape, right? You don't want to be reading about the nightmare that you're living in, do you? It's just, no. Maybe 10 years down the line when it's a memory, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 And I think there's an old saying that in, in, when times are hard, people turn to escapism and fantasy. Exactly. I mean, I, I think I saw recently Games Workshop have had a 15% increase in profits. Mm. I think that that kind of stuff. Warhammer is just everywhere. Uh, I'm going to a, like a gaming club on a Monday night. It's They've seen a, a 80% rise in membership. And, you know, so people do seem to turn to these things in order to to escape the, <laughs> the real world horrors, yes. I suppose. <laughs> The irony for me was um, three years ago, I hadn't heard of, well, I wasn't really into podcasts, the irony of being on a podcast and saying that. But uh, then I, I found out about something called the White Vault and I got into that and I, I found all these other things. And um, yeah, so now I'm quite into podcasts. Yeah. But uh, yeah, before the pandemic, no, just didn't, yeah. hadn't found them. Yeah. Same here. And, and I think, again, it's, that's a technology thing as well, isn't it? Now yeah. you can record studio level music at home you can video on your phone fo- people make films on a phone right you know yeah uh, it's all available to us which from a creative point of view is great this I'd, I'd never done a zoom call to, before the pandemic I, I didn't even know what zoom was <laughs> i remembered skype from back in the day but i'd never never done zoom you know <laughs> it's amazing how well it's come along as well it's come along so quickly it's really good mm. So you've had to have how many? Well, oh, quite a few stories there. They've been published in a lot of a lot of different books. And that, it, do you think there's been an increase in sort of small press publications, an increase in weird fiction and Lovecraftian works? I think there has, in recent years, been more of an increase. And I think also, as the technology of the internet has developed, it's become easier to find people. It's become easier to find submissions. It's become easier to get your work out there. Um, and as I said, I, I discovered podcasts a few years ago, and then I discovered something called the No Sleep Podcast, which I'm not plugging it, but it's really good. And I've had uh, quite a few stories on there in the past few years. Yep. And um, so that's made it, yeah, it, it's surprising how things have changed and moving on. And But then again, of course, there's a, the bad side of technology, all this fear about AI and, you know, computer-generated writing and art. And yeah. So it's, it's a balance, really, isn't it, between using it for good and, the possibility of it being a problem but again it's good story potential though <laughs> it, well yeah it's not not yeah, tip, you know we can always see the ai in the middle of it yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, it's, yeah. it's a hot potato at the moment isn't it on a lot of uh, a lot of facebook groups the ai argument yeah oh yeah definitely yeah, yeah. there's a lot of fear as well will it replace writers and will it what will yeah. it do and hopefully it'll just settle down and become something else that's just there and but we shall see yeah, I'm. I'm hoping it'll be become like the synthesizer, of uh, you know, because there was all this panic with synthesizers, wasn't there, back in yeah. the day? It's, it's taking money off real musicians and all this kind of business, but um, it, it just became another tool that people had. Uh, so I'm hoping, you know, that it's because I know a lot of artists, like very, very well known, well respected artists, who do use the AI it, to aid in composition and almost like uh, as a mock up. Yeah. So they can see how fit their idea would look from a composition point before they go off and actually draw it. I think if, it, I think if used correctly, then it could be a good thing. Yeah, definitely. As long as it's not relied upon to, yeah. Yeah, yeah. In terms of writing, I've seen some people have put um, things like, uh, you know, describe going shopping in a supermarket in MR James style or something like that. It was Gavin? So, <laughs> it was oh, Gavin was Chapel. Oh, right, he did right, a whole right. he did a whole series of them in like <laughs> HP Love HP Lovecraft Ghost <laughs> of the Post Office. <laughs> I remember seeing those. Yeah, Robert E. Howard one as well, wasn't there? Yeah, which can be that's like a fun thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, I think. Um, yeah, we're back to that idea of atmosphere again. I, was, I think to do a piece of copywriting for a new whatever, yeah, AI can be fine. But I, I struggle to see at the moment how it could create that atmosphere because yeah, absolutely. It, it's not just just about yeah. what words you use, it's kind of how you use them. Yeah, it? yeah. So anyone who puts, well, anything out on Facebook or published or anything else is going to draw reviews and comments 
uh, how, how are you with reviews? Do you sort of hunt down your reviews and look at them or do you totally ignore them? Or how, how do you start? Um, every now and then I will creep onto Google and I will just see if there's anything new and just have a look. They're, I haven't had too many so far. Uh, just random things now and then you think, really? But most of the time they've, they've been pretty good. But um, I, I do I do sneak on and have a look. I probably shouldn't. <laughs> but, yeah, I, I just forget sometimes because I'm so busy writing new stories, you forget to go back and look at the old ones. <laughs> but uh, Yeah, definitely. And I almost feel in a way, I mean, we all like a good review, so that's nice. But I quite welcome um, constructive criticism type reviews, you know. But yeah. You, you don't yeah. tend to get that, do you? You tend to get, oh, I thought this was really good, or you just get, it's shit. <laughs> you know? well, yeah, why, that's it. There's no middle ground, is there? Why, why is it shit? What, what, you know, you want to engage that person almost. So, what, yeah. what about it did you think was shit? You know, because I want to know. I just sometimes you see reviews where people have given something one star because they were having a bad day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or yeah. The, yeah, yeah, or the parcel was torn when it came up. I've even seen that. You know? Yeah, yeah. Oh, you get that a lot, actually. The box was torn. To one star review on the book. It's like you're not reviewing Amazon here, you numpty. Yeah. The best one. The best one I have is still my favourite review ever. It was a one star review for an Erie River Publishing um, anthology. Uh, it calls for Forest Volume One, and it was a one star review because this idiot had bought a copy of it and took it camping with them to read to her children. This was an adult horror, <laughs> and she took a screenshot, and, and and it was a screenshot of a line from one of the stories. I forget whose story it was. <laughs> and it was the line, not suitable for children. It's like nowhere on this on this like page does it say that it is suitable for children, <laughs> for goodness sake. You wonder what's wrong with people sometimes. No, oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so, I'm sorry, that's on you. <laughs> I heard people buying things like Pan's Labyrinth because they think it's going to be a sweet little story and playing it to their kids. And it's like, really? Yeah. Do you not read the back? Do you not find out what it's about before you? Or look at the, you know, if it's in this country, look at the rating. Yes. Yeah. 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 But I know books don't have ratings, but it's pretty obvious usually what they are, surely. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, the cover art is usually a big clue, isn't it? And I'm, yeah. I'm surprised in a way that we haven't had that in yet, given the, the furore in America with... Uh, with albums and all that and mm. like you say yeah. on dvds that there's uh no one's thought to bring in that on on books yet but uh i'm not quite sure how that would work really yeah it's strange isn't it because it's, some uh... of the scariest stories i've read you, you, you've got virtually no there's no horror in at all particularly but again it creates that atmosphere and then something happens well, it's like like the willows still to my mind one of the most terrifying things i've ever read but not a lot actually happens. Yeah. There's no, there's no blood. There's no guts. There's none of that. You know, it, it's pure atmosphere, and yeah. and it's absolutely chilling. Um, and I think that's like one of the reasons why it's endured. I think a story that can unsettle you is just it's something special about that. Definitely, yeah. And then gore doesn't do it. You know, no. no. It, it's just it's about the atmosphere, and that's why that's what I was trying to start with. Yeah. Except occasionally when I'm just writing to have a bit of fun with it. You know. <laughs> I did a detective story for you recently, which uh, Indeed. I just, yeah. you know, it's got horror in it, but it was just fun to write. I can tell you were having fun with that. I had fun reading it. <laughs> there is one of them, you know, you know that when you're reading a story and you start to grin, it's just like, yeah, I, I can say he's been having fun with this one. So. And that was exactly what you said about playing in the sandbox. It's like, well, I've got all this stuff. I could do all this with it. And it's just like, let's just do it. And it was just yeah, a blast. There, there is a joy sometimes if it's a particular period, isn't it? I mean, an, an obvious one would be Victorian London. You think, oh, fog, Ooh, yeah. Jack the Ripper, gaslight, cobbled streets. It, it, it's already there, isn't it? Yeah. I've done a lot of that now because I, 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 I'm an amateur ripperologist. I've been interested in Jack the Ripper since I was like a teenager. I've got hundreds of books on the subject. So any excuse to go into that sort of late Victorian, you know, filth and stick some stick some tentacles in there, you know, any excuse and I'm, I'm, I'm on it. You know. Do you have a theory about who Jack the Ripper was? Um, yeah, my favourite is William Henry Berry. Who was he? Was later um, arrested and hung up in Aberdeen, I believe it was. He, he left London just after the, the Rose Milet 
murder, which a lot of people don't see as canon, but I do. Um, it was sort of as a botched. He, he left with his wife and then basically ripped her up in the basement of their house. And uh, yeah, he was a, he was a sawdust merchant and with a yard in the centre of Whitechapel, and he used to take sawdust around all the pubs, which gives him a reason to be on the streets and blah, 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 blah. I've just always seen him as more plausible because he's not one of the sensational ones. He was basically just a drunk bloke in the air, you know, a drunken misogynistic chap who, you know, may or may not have got caught syphilis off a prostitute. So to me, he just seems plausible. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any, uh, is there any era that you've not used yet that you'd uh, you'd like to? Or, or what is your favourite Lovecraftian era, do you think? I do. I have a love of the, the the twenties and thirties. I mean, I love the styles. I love that whole feel. Um, but the trouble with doing historical eras is all the research. <laughs> and, yes. You, know, you, you get so bogged down some of the research, you forget to do the story. Yes. Um, so I kind of almost like creating. One of the reasons I like doing science fiction a lot is you just create your own world of fantasy. You, you draw in what you like. Yeah. Um, but sometimes I try and leave it slightly vague so it, it almost feels timeless, like with the, the detective story I wrote. I started off thinking it might be in the 50s, but then I, I kind of just left it vague and I put in elements that suggest it isn't, but I don't specify it to a time period. But one area I've always wanted is ancient Egypt because of my love of it. But the trouble is, having studied it at Egypt, uh, evening classes for so long, I'm almost frightened to tackle it because I know... I know how much I don't know and how much there is to know. And right. Right. So um, I did recently write a story, which is set in a museum gallery. So I could put in an Egyptian feel, but do something in present day with it. And again, I tend to do like, I do ancient Egypt set in another world or on another time. So I can use elements, but create a fantasy civilization that kind of mirrors, mirrors rather than is the same. So that if there's any inaccuracies, I can say, well, that's because it's, an alternate or a, an other version of it, just to give you a bit of freedom. That reminds me of Stargate, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. No, I really, I really thought that first film was amazing. Yeah. So the early series was pretty good as well, actually. Yeah. I, I do like the series, yeah. but um, yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah, that, that film was had a lot of potential. It looked great on the screen. Yeah, definitely. I suppose that accuracy the accuracy thing is even more compounded when you on a TV series or a film, isn't it? If you're setting in something in like Sharp, for example, then oh no, again they've got the wrong they've got the wrong buttons or all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I think you can get away with it a lot more on a printed page than you can in film. Of course, the trouble with ancient history, especially, is you write something and then two weeks later a new piece of discovery comes along that changes everything. <laughs> <laughs> what you thought is no longer what it was. So. I mean, to some respects, that's the same with Clark Ashton Smith, right? And his story set on Venus before yeah. we had anything a uh, probe going to Venus or anything. And now, you know, it's all impossible. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it doesn't diminish the the enjoyment, I don't think, for no. the story. No, because in, in your mind, it can just be another epoch, can't it? Yeah. It can be <laughs> far future. It's a parallel world where far yeah. future or distant <laughs> past, something like that. Yeah. It's the story that's what, what counts. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So do you have any particular projects that you're working on at the moment? Yeah, I've got a few things in the works. I'm uh, writing some new stuff that I'm hoping to send off to the No Sleep podcast. Uh, I'm waiting on a few things that I've sent off to some anthologies. I'm not really supposed to talk about those yet, though, so until I get a response. But um, I have also got a few things that are due to come out fairly soon, which I'm looking forward to. Uh, there's Weird Fiction Quarterly number three, the summer edition, which I'm hoping will be out this week, if not next week. Uh, it's a collection of 500 word flash fiction and they've got some great writers in it. And it's the third one out, which is uh, the summer edition. Uh, and obviously I've, I've got, I'm working with Tim again. It was the uh, Erie River Cosmic Horror Anthology, I think is due to appear very soon, I think. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's in the work. She's working, Michelle's working on the cover as we speak. So oh, brilliant. Yeah. And obviously, Whisper in Valhalla's creeping up on the horizon somewhere. Indeed, so that'll indeed, be yes, yes, yeah. And the Eldritch Investigations, hopefully. Which yes. Is one I really want to read it because yeah. I want to see how <laughs> I know, to same. It. Yeah, no, that, that's with the publisher. That's just, yeah, as and when. That, yeah. that could be announced tomorrow. It could be announced next week. It's, yeah, imminent. Yeah. 
So there are there are things on the horizon that are imminent, yeah. but I'm just looking forward to seeing them, really. So yeah, so, same. Yeah. It's good stuff. I think, in a sense, that investigator uh, trope or setting is is one of my favourites for Lovecraft, because it, uh, it mixes two... I mean, well, uh, you know, in a way, Lovecraft is made for the detective setting, right? Because it's traditionally someone uncovering clues to a particular situation or event yeah. and then going mad. <laughs> I used to do a lot of the Call of Cthulhu role-playing when I was uh, probably 10 years ago. I moved away from my friends, stupidly, so I don't do it as often now. But um, that, of course, a huge part of that game was the investigation and the uncovering of clues. And I think yeah. I approached the detective story along that kind of line, you know, as if it were almost like a scenario. Yeah. And you, you, we can almost read some stories like that. I mean, Shadow Over Innsmouth is a prime example, isn't it? But, yeah, yeah. But certainly some of the other stories we've covered in the past, we've said you can see this as a scenario, you know, the way it builds. Like, I think yeah. August Derleth, a lot of his stuff is very similar to those scenarios um, because because it is um, it's not quite as atmospheric as Lovecraft stuff. It's more straight to the point. It's more straightforward. Um, and I think a lot of his stuff works really well as them kind of scenarios. Yeah, yeah. and I think that's something, that's something mentioned almost like this yeah. spectrum, this Lovecraftian spectrum from stories that are sort of pulpy uh, adventures all the way through to your more sort of direct Lovecraft things. And then at the other end, you've got people like Thomas Ligotti, who I just think, how, how do you write like that? That's just incredible. There's not there's not a deep one in sight or a tentacle in sight, but it is so chilling. <laughs> yeah, Ligotti, yeah. Kin, and yeah. So conventions is another subject that tends to come up every now and again on this show. <laughs> do you know of any? <laughs> Well, funny enough. <laughs> <laughs> I do believe, I do believe there's one in September called the Innsmouth Literary Festival. So have you, Tim's been to quite a few conventions. I don't think I've been to any conventions, certainly not as a guest. Have, have you attended any conventions yourself, Simon? Um, not this kind of convention. I've obviously have done science fiction conventions, but uh, I've never been to one like this and uh, never as a guest. This is going to be a very interesting experience. All right, it's, it's going to be new for all of us. Yes, <laughs> except me, except me and Anna Spark. Except, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're going to be looking to you to sort of know what to do. As long as there's no sacrifice of the virgins at the end of it. <laughs> yeah, um, new procession. We, we, we are in Bedford, so that might be. Yeah. A bit, <laughs> That might be a bit tough. <laughs> and don't pet the shog off. Yeah. <laughs> and I think, I mean, one thing, well, one, one reason we did it was because we look across to the States and we see Necronomicon and the Lovecraft Film Festival. They seem to have a lot of events going on. Uh, and we, we, we seem to lack that yeah. a bit over here. So, uh, again, it's that idea of just getting people together to talk about weird shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think it's going to be brilliant i'm looking forward to it and i think it's good to get more in this country because as you say everything is so states and it's it's there's a lot of good writers over here there's a lot of you know writing history here and it's it's good to have that yeah i think i think um what's been it's been telling has been the response to it uh it's been a very positive reaction you know, because you you always have in the back of your head, don't you? When you when you announce something like this, that there's going to be somebody somewhere who goes, "Oh, what are you doing that for?" You know, but there's not been none of that. You know, no. no. I mean, like it's like the response of like the traders and things like that has been overwhelming, really, hasn't it? I mean, that room is going to be packed with some weird and wonderful stuff. <laughs> it got some very strange things that are going to be on sale. <laughs> But you know, it's strange in a good way. Yeah, yeah. They so we've got everything from books and maps and the, you know the usual sort of thing, all the way to what was it you told me about this morning? Look, Cthulhu garden gnomes. Yeah, Cthulhu garden ornaments, which I thought was great. That's amazing. I want some from a balcony. <laughs> and, and, and through to things in jars, which I've seen some photographs, and I'm not quite sure what they are. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, we all need things in jars every now and again. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's taxidermy as well, isn't it? Yeah, it's going to be going to be very, very interesting. And uh, and like I say, yeah, and you're one of our guests, and we've got a very good lineup of that. And uh, yeah, I think it's going to be a very good day. So, have you got have you got any nerves about that? I think we we've, we've discussed this before. Yeah, just just a few, you know. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> more worried about just sitting there like a, a rabbit in headlights just you know. yeah but i think it's going to be fine it's going to be an interesting day great experience and uh, I, I can't wait to look around these trader stores now i want to think of a jar <laughs> <laughs> I'm just worried I'm going to spend all my money on books, but uh, yes, so, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. going to be, uh, yeah, that's going to be a thing, isn't it? What was the, was it the terrible old man who put people in jars or something like that? Was it? That's yeah, yeah it was the terrible yeah. old man. Perhaps that's who it yeah. is. Perhaps it's the yeah. terrible old man, limited or something. I don't know. That's amazing. Oh, they, they should change. If it isn't, they should change their yeah. name to that now. Yeah. <laughs> So let's finish up with a, a, a couple of que questions, our quick fire round <laughs> that we usually ask our guests. Who do you think, who do you, think you are, Bob Holness? <laughs> I'll take a peep please, Bob. <laughs> uh, we mentioned film a little bit earlier on, or briefly. Lovecraftian film adaptations, uh, possible or not, and what do you think has been the best so far? Oh, that's a good question. Um, um, well, I know you, you spoke, recently about Dagon with um, Stuart Gordon as gone. That's one I really like. Um, there's, oh, what else? Let's think there was, um, well, there was Mouth of, I don't get the title right, Mouth of Madness, which was- In the, the Mouth, yeah. In the Mouth, that's the one, yeah. yeah. That was an interesting one. I, I liked the way that went. I actually, I actually wrote a prequel to that for Eighth Tower Records. It's in their Terrorvision anthology. Should you have that one up? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh, I had real fun with that because I had to watch it, and I got the soundtrack. You know, because I love John Carpenter's yeah. music, so I had the soundtrack on the headphones while I'm writing it. <laughs> it's just, yeah, brilliant. I really enjoyed that. Then, of course, we had the color out of space, but I'm still not sure about the choice of um, Nick Cage. Mm. Yes, yeah, same. <laughs> I think. I, I think. I'm, yeah, I think I need to watch that again. I watched it once and kind of liked it. But I, yeah, I know what you mean. He's just so strange. <laughs> it's just before he's meant to be strange, he's just yeah. I I preferred the black and white one, De Faber. Yes, that's... I thought that was a much better adaptation personally. It's interesting that both chose the same on-screen color for the color, though. Mm, it is, isn't it's, it? Yeah, yeah. It's an odd choice, but it works. But I think it works better in De Faber because everything's black and white, and that's the only thing that's in color. Yeah, and that makes it stand out. Whereas, yeah, maybe if the other version had done something similar, I don't know. It's, it's a hard thing to portray. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And, and well, that's that's the challenge of Lovecraft in general, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, the, the idea of the colour or even creatures that just to see them brings madness. How do you replicate that? Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, it's a tough one. And in a sense, if you have Cthulhu turn up, is it just like Godzilla really or something? Did you see the H.P. Lovecraft Historical Society did their version of Call of Cthulhu? Yes, yeah, stunning. Yeah, I, I like that one a lot. And it almost looked like it was from the 20s. It was just so brilliantly done. That was yeah. very well done. Very good idea to do it in that way as well. Yeah. Yeah, that whisper in the darkness was really good as well. Um, what you're saying about it just with like Cthulhu coming across like Godzilla, I mean, a great example of that would be that fairly recent one, um, Underwater. Uh, I, I couldn't get through that. I watched the start of it. And it I, I liked it. I enjoyed it for what it was, but but it, they kind of wasted the yeah. idea of it because, again, it was just like any monster with tentacles at the end. But it's, this is Cthulhu. This is like, you know, <laughs> come on. There wasn't much point for him being there. It was kind of like, oh, he's just there. Okay. And it didn't really tie into any of the mythology in any way. It was just like, it's just a monster. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think that's yeah. the problem. It, it's just a kraken or something. It could have just been, yeah. couldn't it? You know, and and that's the yeah. challenge again, isn't it? Is making it more than a monster movie because I'm, I mean, Lovecraft's full of monsters, right? Deep ones and ghouls and all the rest of it, but that's not the main point. It needs a very strong visual atmosphere to really to work, I think, as well. Yeah, I mean, something like Jacob's Ladder, in in a way, would be more of a, a Lovecraftian film. Oh, you know? yeah. That was a great film. I've not yeah. seen the remake, but I, I don't know what that is like. I didn't even know there was a remake, is there? Oh, God. And I'm very dubious. That's one of my favourite films of all time. <laughs> I watched that at the cinema when it came out, and it's, it freaked me out. <laughs> so where can people get in touch with you, or where can people find you on the internet? 
Um, I've got an Amazon author page where they can look at my work and I've got a there's a Facebook group the stories of Simon Bleak and it's set to private to keep trolls out but people who are really interested are always welcome. <laughs> nice. Yeah, don't <laughs> feed the trolls. Yeah I've, I've yeah. had that problem with the, my public group for my radio show and club night uh, every day there's it's the same damn spam post about Simon Cowell going into hospital or something oh yeah something. yeah it just keeps popping yeah. up it's just i keep blocking these people it was bots right and there must be hundreds of them <laughs> why they're all coming to me i don't know <laughs> i've noticed it on one of the robert e howard groups that i'm on there there's a constant stream of people saying hi i really love this stuff i'm glad to have joined mm. and again it's very dubious as to whether they're real people or not yeah but um yeah. you know or any of it's an invasion of spam bots yeah. at the moment definitely. yeah uh, again that's you can almost see that ai scenario <laughs> you, you don't know who you're talking to anymore or what you're talking okay. to <laughs> yeah. you get the dubious friend requests and you think really okay yes oh yeah the, the porn ones are the ones <laughs> the ones that always get me <laughs> they're always so very badly spelt and the grammar's terrible <laughs> so that's the first thing i notice as a writer you know <laughs> not looking at the profile picture the like, yeah i'm absolutely i'm proofreading the blurb <laughs> that's that's a similar thing you know because one of my day jobs is is teaching like fitness and health and qigong and all that kind of thing <laughs> <laughs> and I knew I was getting older and someone said, oh, oh, she's nice looking. Yeah, terrible posture. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And I do, do you find this as well. It gets a bit hard to read something without sometimes critiquing it as you go along. Yes. You, you half read it, as like you say, as a writer or an editor, you know. Definitely. Yeah, all the time. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do I do with video games because I play a lot of um, like indie games which are quite low budget and some a lot of them are made like in different countries so they have an english translation and often the translation is terrible so it really takes me out of the experience where i'm just like going, that comma's in the wrong place <laughs> I'm, i should, should be concentrating on what's going on but i'm not i'm just like that comma's in the wrong place that's not how you spell that <laughs> Ooh, stop it yeah Excellent. Well, I hear the big yellow bus has pulled up outside, so it's time for us to depart Innsmouth. Not for Simon, of course, because uh, as we said before, he gets the full Innsmouth After Dark experience. So check that bolt, push that wardrobe across the door. I'm sure you'll be fine. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot for coming in, Simon. It's been a pleasure to look into it. Nice to chat to you both. Thanks, man. So it just remains for us to say a big thank you to our listeners for today and to Simon for coming in. And of course, a big thank you to all our supporters and patrons. If you'd like to join them, then check out our site at Patreon, where you can sign up at three levels of membership. And remember, you can also sign up now on Buzzsprout at the Acolyte level, which gets you bonus content for both the Innsmouth Book Club and Strange Shadows. You get a quarterly copy of Innsmouth News and you get free entry to that wonderful event we were talking about earlier on. Uh, we're going to be in the Gilman Hotel on our next visit as well. We have another guest coming in, Mr. Paul Fricker of Chaosium and good friends of Jackson Elias, a podcast fame, is going to be coming in for a chat. So we look forward to that. Thanks again to Simon. That's it from me, Rob Poynton. And that's it from me, Tim Mendes. <laughs>